since then, my, my whole life has been martial arts, so you better ask questions involving that, because there's, there's nothing else that I'm interested in other than, you know, teaching what I do, what I, what I teach, and, and help develop people and them to believe in themselves. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 141, and thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk to Grandmaster Rick Alamany. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. Now, if you're in the market for shin guards, please give ours a look. They're double thick, but only where it matters, and they're pre-shaped to your shin so they won't twist around like those flat shin protectors that some companies make. They're a lot easier to clean than the cloth ones, and, you know, honestly, they just hold up really, really well. So check them out, whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, do it. Do it now. I don't even know what kind of accent was that. Was that a terrible Schwarzenegger accent? I'm going to leave it in. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists in an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at our website. It was from the efforts of two past guests that we get to hear from Grandmaster Rick Alamany today. Both Professor Brandon Beliso and Mr. Daniel Hartz coordinated with each other and with our guest. They then reached out to us to coordinate it. Personally, I'm glad they did because I truly enjoyed my conversations with him. Prior to the episode recording, I had a few phone calls with him just to work on schedule stuff and talk about how the show worked. Each time I hung up the phone, I came away feeling that this man is someone special and someone that I was really honored to speak with. I hope that you enjoy hearing what he says as much as I did, and I hope that your reaction is as positive. Here we go. Grandmaster Alamany, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk to me and, and share some stories. It's, it's a pleasure, and I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to, to get going and let you see part of what my life is all about. <laughs> cool. And I, you know, I, still, I still, to this day, whenever I see my, my, my teacher, I, I thank him for giving me a life because. This has been my life is teaching, so um, kind of stumbled onto a better uh, job <laughs> than <the> teaching. <laughs> it's not a job. No, no, it, it's, it's, not it's certainly not. And I know we're going to get into all that and, and a whole bunch more, but I think it's really important for everyone listening and, and for me too that we get some context for who you are. And I, th I can't think of a better way than for you to tell us how you got started in the martial arts. Well, let's see. The very first step, I think, happened when I was working at, at, at the San Francisco Naval Shipyard, and I kind of like punched at this I beam, you know. And and the guy that was uh, working with me said, "Do you take do you take uh, do you take karate?" I said, "No." He said, "Well, how come you you punch like that?" I said, "I don't know. I just punched at it." He said, "Well, I, well, I do." And they said, "Would you be interested in, in going down and seeing a class?" And I said, so absolutely, I'd love to, you know, and I, and I didn't know what, what to expect. I didn't know what reaction I was going to have. And it, it had to happen to be uh, Great Grandmaster Ralph Castro's school that I went to in, in San Francisco on Valencia Street. And I went in and watched, and, and, and everybody was working on forms and, and sets uh, together, and there, everybody was uh, on time, and nobody made a mistake. I thought, wow, that's really impressive to see them working as a group like that. So I, I talked to the to, to great grandmaster Castle. I said, I'm interested. I said, he said, yeah, okay, that'll be uh, uh, $60 to start, $15 for the uniform, and $15 a month, three months in advance. And needless to say, as soon as the next check came, I went in there. But I had to wait about three weeks before I got paid. So what the, the the guy that I was working with started showing me some of the stuff. So when I started with with with, uh, with the class, and and, and Grandmaster Castle was showing me a set, set number one, 
to five, and I just picked it up right away. And then I, and he said, "Wow, you really pick up fast." <laughs> I didn't tell him that, you know, that my friend had showed me, you know. <laughs> and consequently, I, under, I was under pressure that I was going to pick everything up fast, and, and, and I, I was, I was, I was able to do that. And um, so anyway, that's how I, that's how I got started. Started. Uh, that was back in 1962, you know, when I when I got started into, into the martial arts at you know, the Kempo, mm-hmm. the Kempo Kempo Karate system. So, so that yeah. that's early, right? I mean, that's you know, you're you're beyond even what a lot of people would call first wave. You know, a lot of people think of that as as the mid to late 60s, but 1962, there aren't a whole lot of people teaching martial arts in the country at that time. No, no, there was. I think there was. I think that Duke Moore was there. Was there, and then Yamaguchi uh, was another one. I think there was. I can only think there was three. And then and Great Grandmaster Castle. I can only think of it of three. You know, three schools. And you know, so I, you know, when I first got into this thing, I thought well, this is. I played. Let me step back up. I played baseball, hardball, my whole. Uh, you know, when I was uh, from my, I think ten years old, all the way up to the Navy, and then when I got out of the Navy, I, I played for in a, in a city league in San Francisco. But as soon as I saw the Campo, that was the end of my baseball baseball career. Really? Yeah, I found something that that, that I was I, I I was I would make I have to to work hard to you know to make me better. Than you know, than the average person. That was my oh, it was my always my goal was to to be better by doing it more than everybody else. So consequently, I would work, wake up. He show me a routine to, to to practice. I would get up in the morning an hour before I go to work and, and work on it at lunchtime at at the shipyard. You know, I'd down a sandwich just before the the whistle blew to have lunch and then work for forty five minutes. So. Consequently, in in two years, and I made made brown belt. Wow. You know, which was it was a short time that it took. It usually took five years for to, to get the black, or you know, five or six years to get the black. But I, but I I just had a set a goal that I want to be the best that I could be doing this. So, consequently, you know, I I think if that when I was a my brown belt, my first tournament, not brown belt, I think, it was, I think it was a blue belt, my first tournament, and I took second. And then that uh, that put a pressure on me that, well, Rick's going to win, you know. So, and consequently, I did very, you know, really well. I got the brown belt and went to the internationals and, you know, took first place in, in, in lightweight brown belt, I think it was in 66, 66 and, then, and then again, at 67, it was harder because, at the internationals, because people now it now it kind of had an, a, a reputation, you know, for for being a pretty good fighter. And then I think my last my last brown belt uh, tournament was with the Chuck Norris tournament in Las Vegas. You know, which was to a first place there. Then I then I made, then I from then on I fought, I fought black. And uh, my first tournament in black. Um, I thought that, oh, I'm fighting this guy that I beat four or five times already, so I'll just have to go in the ring and 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 uh, it'll, it'll just fall in my lap. I lost, <laughs> really, <laughs> which I needed to, to to I needed to feel that feeling of what I didn't like, <laughs> and I didn't like that that feeling of losing. So it just made me more humble and 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 appreciate what you know, what I accomplished already. Just try to get better and practice harder, and and not take any any uh, competition for granted ever. Well, so, you know, we we got a sense as to to how you got started, but I'd like to to talk a little bit about the the why. So, you know, here you are, you're at work, you throw this punch, and a gentleman that you work with invites you to go to a karate class to watch it. Right. You must have had some idea of what martial arts was. You, I, I'm guessing there there must have been some, even if it was subconscious, interest in training. 
the training training in anything is is, is to be the best that I could be at everything I did. If we, if we were going to, I mean, they, they take the Navy for instance, and you you got the kitchen duty, and they got I'm, I'm doing the pots and pans. Well, I'm, I'm I'm racing the guys in the front to try to see if I could beat them before the, you know, before, <laughs> so they only have one pan coming in. I'm already, and that's it, and I'm done with. with with that, so I was just real. I was real competitive that way. In anything I did, I I wanted to be the best at it. So that carried over onto the martial arts because there was a sense of accomplishment when you practice and you get it, you know, and you get you know where, where things just start to come naturally or automatic for you, you know. Then you realize that it's all about practicing and practicing correctly. And, and doing this as, as often as you can, and never get bored at getting better. Mm-hmm. You know that's why I say repetition. You know, how can you get bored or feel bad about getting better? The more you do it, the better you get. There, there is no secret. That is the secret, actually. Mm-hmm. That that is that is probably the most elegant reasoning I've ever heard for practicing anything. If you're, you're, how, how can you justify not doing it if you're going to get better? Right, you know. So that's how people get, you know, get uh, to start believing in themselves is through movement. They get that. They, they, they succeed. They said, "Well, you can succeed anything you want. You just got to want to do it, and then and put the work in that that, that involves you know getting better for whatever you wanted to to be successful at." I mean, that's the biggest payment that you get as a teacher is when the student comes back and says. Wow, that really, really made a big difference in my life. You know, it, it isn't about the money. You know, never has been. I'm not. I'm not good at that part anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you and many other martial arts instructors. Right. Sure. Take the sweatshirt. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and somebody would, would sometimes. It was happened the other day. They said, "Oh no, that's that's twenty-five dollars." Oh, yeah. Well. If you want to pay, pay if you don't. <laughs> so not a good business guy. Well, I think everyone has an opportunity to leave a mark on the world in, in different ways. And you certainly have left yours as an instructor. Um, you know, we, we've, you know, this is a good opportunity to mention to people that uh, past guest on the show, Professor Brandon Beliso, had actually, uh, through someone kind of downline in his system, had reached out to me, to make sure that this interview happened, that it was important to him because you are important to him. You are important to quite a few people uh, I've learned over the last few weeks. And so it's great to, to have you here and hear your stories. And I know you've got a lot more stories. I'm, I'm sure you've got tons. You've been, well, well, you've been training yeah. and training with amazing people for, for quite a long time. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was real fortunate. It just seems that when I needed it, then somebody would drop in and it'd be exactly what I needed, you know, to further my training in, in, in the martial arts. You know, I know that, I mean, a story just in, in the early days when I was doing the Stella Brown Belt, I went to, uh, um, oh, God, I'm trying to think of this, June Reese tournament on the East Coast, and I, I can't exactly remember where, where it was, but I went there with Ralph Castro and Ed Parker. And then they used me as a, as an attendant, an attacker, <laughs> and he did. He swept me. It wasn't part of the, the kata that he did. He showed us. He showed us to, to punch and cover back and cover back. And then when he did it to me, he, he swept me and 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 uh, and uh, threw me uh, face down on the mat and then palm in the back. And I went, "Whoa, that's what's like being a, an attacker on all these guys that are." High ranking, you know. And Ed Parker was on, was sitting at the side of the ring, and the couple of guys got up there, and they they used a real knife, and so the guy did a bunch of fancy moves with the knife. Then he went stab, stab the guy right through the, through his hand, and Ed Parker Parker didn't know where the mic was on. He said, "Get that off the, out, out of the ring," but he didn't see. She said a derogatory word. <laughs> <laughs> it went all over, over the intercom system and all, in this big gym, this big uh, place that you and me had this tournament. 
<laughs> How did you meet but, him? Uh, that, that's the other thing, too, was a uh, very small thing. It was very rough. The caster goes, and this is my fighter that I brought. My fighter, this is my fighter. His name is uh, <laughs> Rick. Rick. Oh, Rick. Rick Alamani. I mean, <laughs> you forgot, forgot your name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only guy you brought. I'm the only guy you brought. <laughs> yeah. How did you meet Grandmaster Parker? Uh, through uh, Ralph Castle at the Internationals, I think in '66, when I was a when I was a brown belt. It was my first. That was actually my first big competition. You know where I, you know where I placed. But I met, met him through to Ralph because Ralph and him are both from Hawaii, and I think they both were in the Coast Guard together, and I think that's how they they met each other. They both took from Chow, but I think at different times, Professor Chow. Mm-hmm. They they both took at different times, and uh, I mean they they say that that uh, that Parker made his black belt and it was from from Chow and and uh, Ralph Castle. Um, uh, it might have been a, a purple belt or a lower a lower belt, but man, if that was the case, you know, he sure had some fantastic mar- Kempo uh, forms and and it, you know made us, you know, good good martial arts artists and, and and great fighters. That's another thing too is this is you know trying to spar with with uh, with my t- teacher mm-hmm. useless. You know, not that he's going to do anything for me. But you can't hit the guy that they gave you, you know, gave, put you where you're at. So I, I couldn't even throw a punch towards him, ever. It just was just it was too negative of a feeling. Mm. So other than martial arts, which you know is 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 your life, as we've we've talked on the phone before. Do you have any other interests? Is there anything else that you felt passionate about through your life? Never as much as as as, as, the, as the martial arts. Not nothing. Somebody wanted to. They interviewed me. One of my friends are here in Antioch, and and uh, they said I just want to interview you on you know on oh, what your life is. Well, well then my my whole life has been martial arts. So you better ask questions involving that because there's there's nothing else that I'm interested in other than. You know, teaching what I do, what I what I teach, and and help develop people and give them to believe in themselves. So I, I that's that's my whole life in a nutshell. Is 54 years of you know I'm running out of breath. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. I have, I have a, a long problem. Yeah. Would you like to take a break? No. Uh, okay. Okay. No. No, you're down to the end. <laughs> All right. He's going to fall on, on the mat and go. Just, just like a sparring match. Just like a sparring match. Don't give up. Well, hopefully this, uh, no, nobody's getting hurt out of this. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I have to take oxygen periodically. Mm-hmm. Tell us about a time in your life where something didn't go well. Something was difficult or, or, or whatnot. You know, I'll, I'll leave that vague intentionally. And tell us how your martial arts training allowed you to overcome that. Okay. Did I say that first part again? Just think of a, a difficult time in your life. You know, some people that have come onto the show have told us about a physical altercation where they oh, were, you know, oh. confronted by people or um, a loss of in, in their family or a difficult financial time. Yeah, I, I think the the most difficult time I had was in my relationship with my first uh, spouse. You know, it's a, the negativity and the yelling and screaming, and, and I'm just not an argumentative type of person. And the, and and the martial arts really helped me in that. In that, I just bury myself into my into my forms and 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 and, and training to to get better at fighting. It just it just made me do that because I had to to to, co- to cover that that negativity that that was you know, being you know led through by a, a very very negative you know, negative person. So 
thank God for my wife now who got me out of, the, out of that relationship. Mm. How do you think it would have gone if you didn't have the martial arts to bury yourself in during that I time? I don't think it would have had the discipline to do it. You know, I'm, not, I'm not sure. It may, it may have been part of me. Maybe, maybe that's always been a part of, of who I am, is I'd find something. Okay, now I'm going to go out there and the batting tee and and and, and we'll do that for a couple hours, you know. I'll probably find something that I have to do that I can cover that up. You know, so, so I put my mind someplace else, and that's why, you know, that's what we do anyway when we're doing the martial arts is we put this in a different space, you know. And so something negative is happening, you know, get up, do a couple of forms, and or, or even just, just run around the block, you know, do something physical, and you'd be surprised how you just, see the, the, the stress of whatever you're going through, you know, isn't so important. Right. Like, you know, movement is life, not moving is, is not. Yeah. I know you've had yeah. the opportunity to train with, with quite a few amazing people. You've, you mentioned a few names already. I know of some other names, and I'm sure there are many, many names that I don't know. Yeah, well, the first, uh, first one was, was well, Ralph Castro, of course, was my, my main teacher. But we had a, a, a falling out. Um, and the, the, the reason was I had started a school out in Pacifica, you know, in the head of about 25 people. And, and Great Grandmaster Castle came out there to, to watch the class and said, well, I'm going to kind of take over this class. You go back to the main school and you can teach the sparring class there. And I, I want to take over. And he said, because you, these guys seem like they're awfully cocky like you are. Well, I never viewed myself as being a, a cocky person, you know. Uh, I mean, I've always thought that I was a fairly humble type of guy, but he he, he took over, and and I, so I taught the sparring class, and I've never been abusive, but I, but I am a sticker for, for, for you know, being in good condition. So he got a lot of complaints because it was the class was, it was getting to be too difficult for everybody. They couldn't do it due to, due to what, I, what I had been planning for them, and... and so he just said, hey, I, I, I can't have you teach my class. And I understood because that's his livelihood. It's his money. I mean, his money coming into the class. So so I just had no problem. But a couple of guys, matter of fact, it was Brandon's father, he asked me if I could teach on uh, teach him on Tuesday or, or Thursday. I can't remember now which, which day it was. I, and I said, oh, sure, no problem. You and your brothers? Yeah, no problem. But that, that went from those three guys to to 30. And so I, I half the guys that were in my, the guys that were in my class uh, over at Banner's father's place was from the school. And I told the guys, I said, hey, listen, you know, I didn't, it, it, it snowballed on me. I didn't expect that to happen, you know, where, where, where people actually liked the, the, the workout. So I, I, I told uh, the, the brothers, uh, and his father, Brandon's father, that I have to tell you know, great grandmaster Castle that I'm doing this because this, I didn't expect this to snowball like this, you know. And so what I'm doing is not really the right thing to do. And so, and so before I can do that, one of the brothers went and told great grandmaster Castle that I'm qu I'm quitting. He said, "Well, why are you quitting?" So I'm going to go to Rick Allen School. Mm. <laughs> the elementary school. He just said he doesn't have a school, and it was in in uh, Brandon's father's uh, a basement. And uh, I mean, I was uh, they were working out by myself and they're going through my forms and whatever, through my regular workout. And I get a knock on the door and I open it up and there was great grandmaster Castro and he and I went, whoa and he goes, hey, I want you at my school um, uh, Thursday. And I said, wow, sparring night. Yeah, you know, with that, it, that's going to entail. So, I brought all the guys over there with me, and we tried to explain. We didn't expect it to snowball like this, you know. You know, before we know it, we, you know, I was basically in in in, in Kempo troubles, so to speak. And but anyway, they he said, "Well, you're no longer a black belt in my school, and 
he took my belt. I didn't get, bring my. I didn't come dressed in my uniform. I just rolled the belt up, which I thought was respectful. Respectful. They they thought it wasn't respectful. And uh, when all my students were trying to explain them, you know, we, you know, we, it, it snowballed. We didn't mean to. We didn't know that this was going to happen. You know, so they said, "Well, anybody wants to go with Mr. Alameda, go, go ahead and go with Mr. Alameda." But they all, they all came with me, and, and that's how my school kind of started. Started with with, with, with uh, that group. Did you ever have a chance to settle that to to make amends? Yes. Well, I went back and I, and my ego got me, got a hold of me, and I. Went out to the car, got my diploma, and I always regretted that. And I, I, I bought the, the, the diploma. And he was had his he was at the desk with his head down and his arms. I mean, he, he didn't want to do this. He he really gave me a lot of attention. You know, uh, you know. Matter of fact, I was I was helping teaching private lessons sometimes during the day when, after I had a back, a back operation. And uh, you know, so he t- he showed me more than he showed most people. You know, he was like a like a like a father to me, really. You know, but he and, and I, but he gave me back the diploma later. What happened was uh, I got the the job as a technical advisor in Killer Elite, you know, with James Conn. Yeah. And uh, and and I was you know and so I'm going to be showing his daughters, <laughs> you know, what to do in the fight scenes, right there. So so they they kind of softened up to me. Mm-hmm. At, you know, at that point, and and I thought that was that that was great. I felt real comfortable with, you know, because I I mean, I, when when we had the first breakup, the students were going, yeah, you know, that Mr. Castro. I said, wait a minute, man, time out. Don't talk about that that way about my instructor. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, and you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't. I never let anybody, um, you know, bad mouth bad mouth him. I mean, that's. I, I, it was just it wasn't the right thing to do. But in any case, after that, after that, then I started taking private lessons from him, and and, and he got back in his good graces again. And there was only one other uh, incident, and the negative incident incident was uh, I was one of the founders of a, of a, a Tama organization, and, and which is fairly successful successful when it was growing. And uh, Duke had promoted me to to ninth, and then 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 to tenth. And so the the, the castles invited me to invited me to to a big meeting with black girls, and and I sat in the stands. They said, "Oh no, come on! You, you want to come out here and, and sit with the family?" And then he goes, he stands up and goes. Okay, I just want everybody to know that Rick Alamany is not going to be taking over the Campbell Karate system. Then I said, "Excuse me, with all due respect, and and I don't want to. That's not that's not my aim is to take over the the Campbell organization. Your Campbell organization. I'm I'm what I am because my students pushed me up there. Duke had said, "Hey, what, what what's your where's your list of black girls? Oh, here it is, 200. You know, I said, "Wow, you know." So anyway. They, that caused a little bit of dissension for a little bit, and then again, you know, it, it it softened up and got back together. So we have a good relationship now. He invited me to a, a special uh, uh, seminar that he did for all this for the black belts, and and then had me be a special guest. And I didn't put that that much importance on it until the, the seminar came up, and he introduced me first as a special guest, and he recognized my tenth. Mm. That was just you know you you always wanted to please you know your, your instructor your teacher and and then finally I got what I, what I really been you know wanting from his his respect and you know that that, that I'm I'm a positive uh, force in his life. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> wow, that was awful. It was. It was, it was good, it, it, you know. And the funny thing is, we haven't even really gotten to the question yet. I love the tangents. It's it, the listeners know I love I love tangents. They're the best stuff. So and I'm a tangent kind of guy. <laughs> well, hey, perfect. That's why we're doing this. Now, obviously, 
great grandmaster Castro was, you know, was, was the one who got you started. He's the one that probably, I, I'm guessing you would agree, was most influential in your martial arts upbringing. Absolutely. Yeah, well, they always ask me, who was your, who, who did you look up to when you first started? I looked up to him when I first started and, and still do. Was there anyone else along the way that that also had a significant impact on you? Um, well, after the, the breakup, uh, the first, that first breakup from uh, Pacifica, um, they they blackmailed me, bombed me the, the capital uh, system, blackmailed me from entering any of mm-hmm. the tournaments that that the Hawaiians, Hawaiian people threw, and uh, so. I needed to belong to an organization. I was working out with Johnny Pereira, who was uh, um, one of uh, Biggie Kim and Duke Morris guys, and they they took me under their, their wing. And I guess what was influential is, is the, the way the foundation was. You know, I kind of copied some of their stances and and, and some of the ways that they did their their, their thrust kicks and, and and so that 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 part of it. Uh, I guess I got that that from them, but uh, I think after that, I'm trying to think of who came after. I think I was doing another movie with, with somebody we having tryouts in my school, and, and uh, Ramy Pieces came to the door, and I didn't know who he was at first, and he said, "Hey, my name is you know Ramy Pieces, and you know I, I do the Filipino Arnis, and you know would you be interested?" Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I I got the try, trials right now, so uh, could you come back? And he came back, and you know he showed me some stuff, and and, uh, and I liked it, and and it was very influential to me, adding it to my as part of my system. Yeah, then then uh, then I also took from his brother Ernesto. When when Ramy uh, went on tour, I I kind of introduced Ramy to uh, Bruce Judnick, and Bruce. Uh, I went over there to to do a seminar, and Ramey went with me. He just sat in the corner with his legs crossed and watched me, and then he finished and goes, very good, Weeks, you know, you are very good. I said, hey, thanks. And Bruce wanted to meet him. Bruce goes, yeah, I take from Angel Cabalas. Do you want, do you want to play? <laughs> Mistake. <laughs> the play means you're challenging the guy. Yeah. You know, so so Ramey didn't, didn't, didn't hurt him, hurt him, but he... He let him know who boss was, and then Ray, then Bruce took him on on tour, on his tour around the United States, where he did seminars all over the place, and so that was real good for Ramey. But but I never seen him after that, and and I had an opportunity to, to take uh, uh, a, a a class from Ernesto, and I just can't remember the name of the school I went to, but but then he 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 came and started doing seminars for me and. And, and then, I, so I could add on to to what Ramey had taught, because he taught the same thing. They're both both far out demonstrators, but they they're they're low key when you see them. And when they move, it's it's unbelievable. It's like magic. And that that really helped, uh, you know, helped our system out. Yeah. And and it's helped me out this last few few months because I've been having health problems and been breathing uh, breathing problems. So. Yeah, I've been falling to the sticks, you know. It really helped me tremendously because it doesn't take so much out of me. Mm. We had the chance to, I had the chance to talk to Hanchi Jetnik uh, back on episode 120, and, and what a great guy. Oh, yeah. You know, su- he, such, he, a, he, such a large personality. And, and you know, see, the the thing that I found interesting about my conversation with him is he's been involved with everyone. I mean, whether it was a uh, in passing or he spent time training with them, it seems like he knows everyone. Yeah, I got him when he was a second degree and promoted him from from third up to until until sixth. Oh, okay. He, yeah, and then he then he uh, he uh, he called me one day and, and said, "Hey, who is this guy, uh, James Matosi?" <laughs> said, that's the guy, you know. He, he said, "Well, he's in in in, in Folsom, and, and people were saying that he was some kind of a great martial, you know, martial artist." And I said, "Well, well it's true, because when I was teaching for for Great Grandmaster Castle, when I, I had my back operation, 
Right, that, that he had that Matosi's book in his desk, and then I was reading it, and he said, no, "You're not ready for that yet." So no problem. But I, I got the gist of it, you know, of um, who, who Matosi was, and and then that's what Bruce was was good at doing is was he he got the Hawaiian you know instructors to to be recognized for who they were and what they had done for the, for the martial arts in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. He, he did a lot, you know. People would say, "Oh, he's all in it for the money." You're looking at the wrong part of it, you know. The the fact that you would have never met some of these guys, and I would have have not met them if if it hadn't been for Bruce. And he has that gathering all the time. I I miss the last couple mainly because it's the traveling and and uh, was was a little bit you know too much for me. Sure, sure. We had a chance to to hear a little bit about Hanji Jutnik's time. With Matosi, you know, traveling to, I think it was Texas where where he was incarcerated, if I remember, but maybe I'm no, he was, he was incarcerated in Folsom. Okay. So he he Bruce had asked me, do, do I want to meet him? So <laughs> absolutely. And I was walking in to get into the gate of prison of Folsom, and you can feel evil. You know, it, it, it was crushing almost. Really? You know the, the, how heavy that evil feeling was when I went in there. Then I met met him, you know, and we were sitting outside. I think it was a cement kind of table and benches, benches. And he just commenced to tell me all about me. You know, he said you're this kind of a guy, and you do this, and this is how you teach, and this is what you believe. And I said, wow, you know, awesome. Then I'm walking out, and then I turn around and look at the prison, and I said. What did this guy do? Hypnotize me? The, 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 the prison looks like a castle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bruce's wife and my wife were were walking towards us, and all I could see was my teeth. I had this just gigantic smile on my face that I couldn't get get out of it so overwhelmed by meeting this dude, this guy. And he, he was awesome. I he wrote letters. I got I wrote him. I sent him money. You know, some sardines. You know, with with no. You know the. He didn't have to do what he did. I didn't. I wasn't doing it for any recognition. You know, he gave me a master's number two certificate. You know, but it, it, that was uh, Parker and and the gang there uh, at the international was said that, that some of my guys are pissed at you for getting that. I said he didn't give it to me for that. They said that, that I'm a number two master physically. It's all it's all about the spiritual aspect of it. You know, so and then he believes that I'm that I. I I passed that requirement, you know, as far as, you know, him asking me questions and telling me how, you know, how, who I, I was and what I was all about. Mm. So, and I, I just, I, I, at first I, I, Parker said that, I just said, you're telling me that somebody that I don't know is, is upset at me, <laughs> upset at me. And I said, well, that, that's important. And I would start to walk away. I said, nah, I'm sorry. I don't really mean that. Because that's not what Matoshi is all about. Mm. You know, this is definitely the spiritual aspect of it is, is what he's, he's all about. Right. So I thought I was really, you know, fortunate to have gotten the chance to meet him. He didn't train. I didn't train underneath him. I didn't ever claim to train underneath him. I just met him and and uh, it was uh, in awe. The guy just didn't belong in there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And does. even the prison guard, the prison uh, uh um, head of the prison had Matosi babysitting his kids outside the, the jail, and uh, his, I think the house was up on the hill. So you know that's how trustworthy he was. And he, he wrote letters saying that Matosi didn't belong there to try to get him out. But, you know he didn't get out to, until he died. Right. And then and yeah, Bruce was instrumental in help taking care of that the funeral and all that. Yeah, it's it's certainly just from. The little bit that I know of him, just such a tragedy that such a talent was confined. You know how how much, yeah. how many people and could we, he have taught? How much good? Yeah, could he it, just could you he know said the wrong thing to, to the wrong guy. You know, one of his students, uh, you know, wasn't all there, and and you know he went over there, and he was the one who physically did the. Uh, the killing of the husband and the wife, not not Matosi. Matosi was just, you know, was just uh, airing it out. Yeah, this guy really screwed me. I gave him money, and 
and now that we're in America now, and that same rule doesn't go with the rule that we had in Japan. When you loan money, then you, you and you succeed in the business, then you pay ten times that. And the guy said, I, "We're in America now. I don't have to pay you anything." They didn't, didn't even pay him back for the original money that he loaned. So I guess he got upset, but he didn't. He just said it to the wrong guy. It wasn't that he aimed at the guy. He said, hey, I want you to go over there and, and uh, straighten these people out and collect from me. He just said that, and the guy was, uh, according to, to Bruce, was a little bit unstable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Maybe it's a lot of stable if he could. <laughs> now, you know, we've heard about some of the people that you've had the opportunity to train with. Was there anybody that you wanted to train with that you didn't get to? Um... Uh, I would like to. I can't get his name. Can't his name. I'm, uh, God, got it. I just another another state guy. Oh, um, I don't. I I really can't think of. I had different people come in. Yeah, oh, God, I can't think. Of, oh, well, Max, 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 Max Fallon. I, and I actually started to, then I moved to Hawaii because uh, I liked what he had to do, the way he, he removed and and how he did his sparring stuff. So, but I never, never got a chance to get back into that. Uh, Max Palin, his, his son Jordan is a, is a fantastic stick fighter. The live stick, you know, with the pads on. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. But, you know. and what, so you would, I mean, you had trained with, with the, both of the priests, yeah, brothers. Yeah, Ramey or uh, Ramey mm-hmm. and Nesto. What was, about, was the, what was it about this other individual that that was different that that made you interested? It's just his, 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 his speed at blocking and and and, 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 sp- and sparring. It was just it was just he did it without even hardly looking. Just bah, 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 and I said, man, that's what I want to be able to do, but. Never really got into it. I moved to Hawaii and and was gone for ten years. So, mm. okay. so I never got a chance to get back into it. You know, Jim Castro was a, uh, uh, was another one. It's just now getting there now. It's got and and he's. I just call him Magic Man. Some of the stuff that I, I did pick up from him, I, I put together and and and. Uh, for, for the katas that I, I, I put together myself, and, you know, it was includes with the sticks and the arnis and the jujitsu. Jujitsu was was that was a that was with Duke Moore, and he had uh, had a, a six weeks course to, to 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 raise money so he can buy certificates for his for his students. So I brought eight of my guys, and they said it's twenty five dollars for the for the whole course, the six week course. I made them pay twenty five dollars every time they went in. I said, "This guy doesn't know how good he is." <laughs> and then, then that was the the beginning of of Duke said, "Wow, can you come down and show my guys some sparring stuff at my house?" I said, "Oh, sure, absolutely." And then after that, he said, hey, "But we had to do is we had to get these different martial artists together and share knowledge, and then and, and be a a, a, a a body that can can help people, you know, uh, get rank." In, you know, uh, because we have that person representing that style, and so no matter what, how they lost, they lost their teacher somehow. Don't have a teacher, and we we had the style. So that's how Atama got started. The Teachers Association share knowledge and, and help people, people with their rank. Hindsight is we should have. Drank them for a year first to see if they're going to really stay. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight, <laughs> right? Rats. <laughs> we messed up there. <laughs> we talked a little bit about, you know, a couple movies that you know you were involved in. So, I'm guessing that you have yeah, some they... af- affinity for for martial arts films. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I... That, that's the part that I wanted to, to if I was going to get involved in it was, it was the stunt aspect of it and putting fights together the the reason that we they had try, tryouts on Van Ness I can't remember the name of the hotel 
on Venice, and, and we had done a, a, a demonstration for a Filipino audience, and, and so we already had a routine set. So we they said, okay, show us what you do, and there's a table, and we we did it. It was like to us, just, okay, there's an audience, so we'll start it this way where they'd never see the hit uh, other than the ones we want them to see, and, and but, but, but they know what happened. And so I, I just walked out and did a back nugget, or did a punch, flipped the guy over, over, and they said, stop. You know, I said, okay, what, 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 is there a problem? The problem said, no, no, we want to film it. They, they, they filmed it because they wanted to show it to Peck and Paul. And so the, the next day when we went back, you know, Peck and Paul said, can you make up a fight scene? Or, you know, first of all, he asked me who put this together. I said, I did. He said, can you make up a fight scene at lunch? I said, sure, just tell me what the, what the situation is. And and I, and I did it. And they, they hired me as a technical advisor along with Kubota's uh, guy. And the problem with with Kubota's guy was he was Japanese style was trying to make a, a Kempo guy or Kung Fu guy or Taekwondo guy do the Japanese way of blocking. What I did, I just, if I throw this, what would you do? And I just threw it. Do it, and they would come up with a block that they would naturally do for, as part of their style. So I, I, I literally made them almost make up their own their own fight scene, and which uh, the only the difference. It, well, what made it easy was because if you got hit low in the groin, then you're bent over, and that tells you there's another target with the neck. You know, <laughs> so it was easy to get them to do it. You were bringing some authenticity. Just help them out with the speed yeah. aspect of it and angle to the camera and. What are your thoughts? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. What are your thoughts on the movies, you know, from back then versus you know, if you've seen any of the films that have come out more recently? Well, they're more they're 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 a higher degree of difficulty uh, now, just like the the tournament scene where they take out the groin shot in in favor of you know all the high head kicks, you know, so. It's exciting. I guess it's exciting. I guess it just depends who who does it. You know, everybody knew who Chuck was when he got out there, and you're always hoping that he would make it, and it was couldn't happen to a nicer guy. You knew him, or no? Yeah, met him. Yeah, yeah, met him. We we talked in tournaments. We we fought, I fought against we fought against his team. At that, he he wrote he's wrote written a couple of notes to me. Where my students had ran into him in, in Las Vegas, and you know, sorry, I missed you. And I think a book writing he wrote inside the book, you know, I missed the good old days. And when he came on 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 uh, into San Francisco and did uh, Eye for an Eye, one of my friends, sparring partners, was uh, one of the actors in there, and he said, "Hey, come on down and see Chuck." And then he just said, hey, "Wait, I got to do a scene, did a scene, and then we went to." You know, to his, to his, his uh, cabin and and uh, talk for a couple hours about the uh, the old days. Then I told him, "Well, it is in old days. I'm I'm still fighting." He said, "What? You're 40 and you're still fighting?" He said, "Yeah, I got to fight tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I came out of retirement. That was a trip. Yeah. Tell us about that. I've actually heard a couple people talk about that uh, as I've <laughs> talked to them one on one outside of the show. Yeah, what what, what happened? What, uh, I decided to do, I I had split up and I was married again to to my present wife now, and and I I I started getting ready. So I want to come out of retirement because I I was watching the thirty five and over, and I just saw some of the fighters were really good, and I thought, gee, I want I should like to fight that guy, you know. So I started working out to it. And my first tournament was Ron Marchini's tournament in Stockton. Which ten years before that I had I had won the lightweight uh, black belt division, and so I fought in the 35 and over, and I won that. Then I had to fight the lightweight, the middleweight, and the heavyweight. Then for whatever reason, they just weren't moving. I I threw a technique and hit them, and I go, damn, <laughs> why are these guys not getting out of the way or moving? You know, it's just in my timing. Some some days your timing is just on you, on you just can't do no wrong. And then, so I won grand on my first tournament. My goal was to win grand once, if I could, you know, 
and, and I'd do it until I won it, won it. But I won on the first one, <laughs> the first one when I entered. And it was, which I should have been disqualified on the first hit. Matter of fact, Bruce was my judge, he was the set of judge. And I, and I was so hyped up that I came off the line with a back knuckle and knocked it down with a back knuckle. But he said, Mr. Alamany, one more time I have to disqualify you. But then I, I calmed down. But my adrenaline was haywire. Because <laughs> it's How? been two or three years. Yeah, that was my question. Since I had fought. Yeah. And then I won. I won it another, uh, one more time. I, yeah, one, one more time. I entered uh, 12 tournaments. I took uh, 11 first place and one third, wow. which is losing. <laughs> That's losing in your book, third? <laughs> the third is losing. <laughs> but I, I fought a couple more tournaments after that to make sure that when I went out, they went out winning. They didn't want to go out losing. So you re- that you weren't just kind of talking when you said that you're you're competitive. You you are that competitive. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And one one the biggest one was the Cow Palace, where I where, where I fought some na- some name guys, but one of them was was Dan Anderson had just won the international lightweight and. But Dan, what I did, and we got to get, be good friends. But he, he does his attack, and then I run like I'm, like I'm afraid. <laughs> then the next three times he moved, I, did, I, I nailed him. He said, I've never been beat three to nothing ever, you know. I, I said, well, I, I'm a deceptive kind of a fighter. But the, the, the Cow Palace one was, I, I won the lightweight division, and, and, uh, then I, I had to fight the middleweight. It was just some kind of towering, towering guy with legs that went up to his neck. I think, uh, but I, I beat him. Then I fought Johnny Burrell. And Johnny, I had, my nose was busted like it got busted like for three or four, four weeks before that. And then Johnny, that went underneath, and Johnny went over the top and back, knuckling in my nose. And you can see me following him around, going, hey, "Just push it over, just push it over." But he just ran away from me. Then, I, then after I beat him, then I had to fight uh, uh, Bob Halliburton, who was the, the, the grand champion from the year before. And I was fortunate enough to, to, to beat him in overtime. What do, you, what do you not do? What do you not throw at a tall guy that has a, a good body punch, back knuckle? So I, we bowed, and I jumped up the air, back knuckle. <laughs> <laughs> it came down and then bowed. Thank you. Deception, right? Sounds like that was your bread and butter. I don't think you're going to do. But I had some good fights with some good guys out the coast with Alex and Carilla. You know, Bill Wallace. Bill Wallace and I did a class in, in Denver where I taught punching, he taught kicking at Alex Coast Coast uh, School. And then we went out to, to the tournament and they lined everybody big to short. And then we kept going. And before you know it, the only two guys left was me and him. Yeah. And I learned a valuable thing with, with Bill is that it's better to try to react to what he does rather than to try to anticipate. <laughs> it, was, it was quicker to just react. Because if he has his leg in the same spot, round side hook, his knee comes up to the same spot every time, so you don't know which one he's going to throw. <laughs> but he beat me two to nothing, so I took first, he took grand. But he he was he was really on. He he was beating guys seven, eight, eight to eight to to nothing, and eight to two was real real good. And my first match, he stuck me up with the, with the uh, the the tri-state, you know, lightweight, you know, champion. And, and he came off the line and back knuckled me. And then I saw stars, and I I went to Mike Stone. I said. Is that what it is, Mike? Is that he said? That's what it is, buddy. Ah, no problem. So it was seven to two. He got one more point. <laughs> but I was—I think I was a little upset that they, they came all the way from, from California and they stuck me with their top guy. But it worked out. It worked out. Yeah, it worked out. <sighs> Let's talk about books for a second. Have you? Do you, do you have have you written any books? I apologize no, for not knowing the answer to that. Yeah, no, I, I, I haven't. Okay. I haven't written any, any books at all. I got 
I have notes and and stuff that you know that that I need to start putting together. I'm, I'm getting help now from one of my students that, that that's, that's coming today at ten, matter of fact, and and I gave him notes and so he can read it over and uh, and see what where I need to improve on it and and what else can I add add to it and if it's feasible to to put put it into a book. But you know, slightly strategies and you know. Yeah. I I would like to read a book that you wrote. I, I can tell that there's a there's a lot that you've collected from others and and, and formed and um I think that that would be interesting and and of course uh let me just take the moment for anybody that's new to the show that's listening um you know I'm I'm going to say when because I I'm I'm going to hope that that the a book does happen. Uh you know, we'll list it in the show notes. We we will have show notes. Everything we talk about today on any of the episodes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the website. And links to the other, you know, the other folks that we've talked about that have been on the show, like Bill Wallace, like Hanchi Jutnik. So um, are there books from others that you've enjoyed that you might recommend to people listening? Yeah, Dan, Dan Anderson's book on sparring is, is a good one that I have a Art of War. <laughs> I, I think that's the most recommended book. Why, why do you recommend it? <laughs> because what you, it's the strategy that, that you end up developing as, as a fighter is, is timeless. You know, the, 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 you read, read the, the, the Art of War go, oh, wait a minute, that's my idea. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty amazing the strategies on 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 fighting in in particular are, are timeless you know and and uh, well, I can't think of the word right now but anyway that, that's probably one of the, the the better the better strategy books that I that I liked yeah so are you continuing to to train to Challenge yourself. I mean, what it, martial arts is your life. I mean, we we know that. So, yeah. how the, how does that tie into your days now? Uh, I, I, I'm having having to readjust uh, readjust my workout because I I have to I have to keep my oxygen level up. I have I have uh, stage three lung cancer, so it's preventing me from. From try, trying to do everything like I, 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 like I did until six months ago, you know, three or four times a week, I'd run through all my bases, all my katas, you know, and uh, and teach. And right now, it's it's, it's trying to keep, it's, they're trying to keep me down, and, and, and rightfully so, because I I only have one way of, of, of showing technique, and that's the way I've been doing it for 54 years. So and, and then I get winded, so I, I just won't show as much and and then and sit down and, and hook up to the uh, to the oxygen tank and get it get it back up to 98. And when when I went when Brandon did that special thing for me at his school in Millbrae, the one of the students uh, that worked at the Hilders on school, Mark uh, Cameron, his wife is a nurse and I was coughing. And she noticed that, so she ran across the street to, to Walgreens, I think, and got a, a, a thing that you put on your finger that tells you your oxygen intake, a percentage of oxygen. Mm-hmm. It was 71. So she said, that's no good. So boost that up. To, to, instead of one liter, two liters, put that thing on my finger, and it went up to 98, and then, then I felt better. Oh, good. So, but I wouldn't have never known about it. I don't know why they didn't tell me. That the reason for for having this oxygen making machine was I'm supposed to be regulating my my oxygen intake, and then when it gets down down to the 70s, that, that obviously I need some pure oxygen. So you know, like I said, you know, I'm going to do this until I can't do it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to. You know, I I I, I canceled out uh, the 12th of December. Just to give me a month break, break, and then start back to uh, to going to Brandon's once a month in January, 
and, and see if I get going in there later than it, than it had been going in there because I teach this class at 7:30 and uh, to nine, and but it's to wait, you know, from getting into San Francisco at one o'clock, and I have to wait all that time, you know, before I teach. Which I I I I didn't mind that before because what I would do is whatever I'm going to teach, I just keep going over and over, to, you know. So anyway, that's where I stand health wise. Sure. Sure, and I'm I'm glad to hear that you're going to keep going. Oh yeah, that, that's... I, I I kind of jokingly said that at, at one of the seminars in I did in San Antonio, just Campo School and. And then I didn't know what I had. I just knew that I was I was out of breath. I, I did like four techniques in, in a row, and I went, "Whoa, man!" Well, I always always wanted to die on the mat. <laughs> 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 Oops, <laughs> bad joke. <laughs> it was like, Who was it? Dan? Dan said, "GC, I'm sorry to hear about your problem." I said, "Hey, bummers, eh?" <laughs> He said, you got a sense of humor. He said, well, what can you do? I can't do nothing about it. It's what happened. So got to got to take the good with the bad, bad with the good, you know, and just keep on doing what I do. What I, what I live to do is teach. And, you know, so, but you can't, you can't, you know, it's hard to do anything soft <laughs> when you've been doing it <laughs> strong for so long. Right. Yeah, I think right, I started... The physical aspect of my workout, you know, I think when I, when I got into, into 70, I think that's when it, I started to feel it a little bit different. Up until then, I was doing 1,200 crunches and doing doing all my katas and all my sets and my basics and and uh, three or four times a, a week, if, if not for six, you know, just to do it. I, I just want to underscore that. You said you started to feel it at 70. Right, I started to feel that, that you know, uh, the, the stamina wasn't there as as, 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 good, as much as it was. So the smart thing to do would be instead of doing this, try to do it six times a week, to cut it down to three. Right. That way I got a day to, to rest in between. There aren't a lot of people that stay that active, that strong, even with their training, how what what would you say made made it different for you? I mean, a lot of people start to say they're seeing things at thirty or forty, some at fifty. I've never oh, heard no, anyone. That, no, fifty, sixty were, were, were prime time. I, I was teaching in Hawaii for ten, for ten years with the gigantic Hawaiians, and and you know you you, you kind of like have to stop them when you when you block. So. So that's what that's what kind of motivated me. Was, was the, I had to change some of the techniques a little bit to fit the, the, some of these monsters, which are you know I, I, I developed some some good guys in Hawaii, you know while I was there. So you know it just led me to believe that the system works. You know, so you, you know, wherever you go, you, you can develop kata champions and and uh, sparring champions. You know, they just have to be willing to do the work. You know, we got the technique and the strategy behind it, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see that grow, grow over there. I got so some people uh, that are still teaching your mind what I taught them, and winning with with what I taught them. Excellent! Wow, that's great. <sighs> so, let's close up. And we always do this in the same way, but you know, I find it to be a great way to, to end. What advice would you give to the people listening? In relation to, to working out? Any advice. I mean, almost everyone that listens is a martial artist. You, 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 you can accomplish just about anything. You just got to want to do it. And, and 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 do the work that's involved in getting you to where you want to go. You know, there, there's no there is no substitute for quantity and and quantity doing everything that you do correctly, no matter what it is. 
you know, so that's my, my, that, that's my 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 goal in teaching people is get, getting them to do to believe in themselves and to be respectful, respect themselves, so you'll respect other people. You know, so we we it's what's what's lacking in in today's martial arts is they they need a little bit more respect. This respect is going out of it to a certain degree, and so if you respect yourself, then you end up respecting people. When I consider Grandmaster Alamany's impact on the martial arts, on the number of people who have been touched by someone he trained, it's mind-boggling. In fact, I'll bet that most of you listening know someone who has trained with Grandmaster Alamany or someone who trained with him. There aren't a whole lot of people we can say that about. Thank you, Grandmaster, for your time. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes, including links and titles to the things we discussed today. There's also a great place to sign up for the newsletter. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Username is Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our secret Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. I guess I can't keep secrets. I just told you about it. We're always open to new guests for the show. So if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or perhaps your instructor or someone else, head on over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Fill out the form there. If you have some other feedback, We'd love to hear it. You can fill out the form on the website or email us, info at whistlekick.com. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. We put out episodes twice a week, every Monday and Thursday. And you know, we're always asking for reviews because they help us spread the word and push us up in the rankings, helps people find the show. Now, we haven't had reviews for a couple weeks. I don't know what's going on there, but please, if you've been listening for a while, help us out. Get over there, go to iTunes. It's the best way to do it. Search for the show. Even if you're subscribing, you kind of got to do it this way. If you're not an iTunes user, you can still do it. Take you a little bit longer, but we'd still appreciate it. It's free. And as a thank you, every week, we're going to give out at least one shirt. Now, let's be honest. It's rare that we have multiple reviews come in in a week. We're still a fairly small show. But if we start getting a whole bunch more reviews, we'll give out more shirts. We want some reviews. All right, I'll shut up now. Remember the products that you can find at whistlekick.com? Every one of them ships for free every day, including today's featured product, our shin guards. If you're a school owner or a team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.